So last time we talked about what is mind and how does the yoga tradition view mind and is it a help or a hindrance in our yoga goals? And so I thought it would be helpful in a similar manner to look at what the yoga body is or how the yoga tradition more specifically has actually viewed the body over the centuries. Nowadays, we stereotypically tend to think of yoga actually happening within the body. So like you do yoga and you move your body and you breathe in your body and you bring your awareness to your body. Um, but has it always actually happened that way? Was that always the approach? What role did the body actually play within the uh, search for liberation? Um, perhaps this body was actually a hindrance and that we should maybe give up attachment to our body. Maybe you've heard uh, ideas like that before. Uh, more than that, and key question in all, in all of this is, what is the relationship of the body, not only to the mind, but also to spirit, or if you want to call it self, the Atman, um, or the soul? Um, maybe some questions that aren't tackled so directly nowadays in modern yoga classes, but still something that is relevant to the tradition, absolutely. And I would like to believe something that kind of happens internally for each practitioner as they're actually you know, doing this thing on the mat or on the cushion, wherever it may be. So how did we get here? So I'm going to start with the ascetic traditions, which, as you might imagine, had quite a kind of distancing attitude towards the body. And um, in the Yoga Sutra, which is kind of the key text, the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali, that we refer to nowadays, even though it doesn't really talk about physical yoga practices almost at all, um, and the way that it describes the attitude to the body is one of distaste, jugupsa. So in the second chapter, when uh, Patanjali is talking about the niyamas, which is the five observances with relation to yourself, that of uh, shaucha cleanliness, santosha, contentment, tapas, which is discipline or challenge or heat, swadhyaya, self-study, and ishvara pranidhana, surrendering to something greater than you. When he talks about shaucha, cleanliness, he says that you should be striving constantly to keep this body clean. Um, and if you do so, that will stop you actually wanting to hang out with other people. And that's a good thing because the body is seen as something uh, unclean and which is going to always be very material and distracts you away from, uh, you know, your more abstract goals and getting away from the material world back to see, you know, the spirit and the essence at the center of everything. Similarly, in early Buddhism, um, there is described meditations on the body, uh, bringing mindfulness into the body, where you meditate on head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, I'm going to do the full list, uh, flesh, tendons, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, pleura, spleen, lungs, large intestines, small intestines, gorge, feces, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, skin oil, saliva, mucus, fluid in the joints, and urine. And you're supposed to meditate on this. And if you do that, your mind will gather and settle inwardly grow unified and centered. I'm quoting from the uh, Kaya Gata Sati Sutta. It's, a, it's from the Pali Canon. Um, so early Buddhist texts. You meditate on basically the grossness of the body and that helps you to kind of interiorize into your lovely inner landscape. Um, almost as if like you realize how disgusting the body is and so you stop associating yourself with it. But I would say that actually from a modern perspective, we tend to try to think of the body as a nice thing, as opposed to something gross and disgusting that you have to carry around with you. Hmm. So that's one approach. But yet, in a way, the body is actually a tool. Because in this Kaya Gata Sati Sutta, it's recommended that the practitioner meditate on the body and thereby find clarity of mind and peace. So you're using your body, and it's very disgusting this, <laughs> to help you to achieve uh, you know, a centered state of mind. Similarly with uh, Patanjali, it's not actually a bad thing to have a body, even though it's so unclean. In chapter two, Patanjali also actually says that the 
purpose of all of the the seen, so the material world, is to for the liberation of the seer. So the fact that you have a body can actually direct you towards your liberative path. Okay, so let's continue a little bit on our path. I like to look at um, some of the ways that we can view the body, not only as just like a heap of gross stuff, uh, but also as something uh, more subtle. So in the Upanishads, we find descriptions of the, t of the body as having several layers. So that our, or this, this thing that we inhabit has several layers, uh, known as koshas or sheaths. Um, and so that we have the physical body, which is the annamaya kosha, which is the, the level of you, the layer of you that's made out of food. Um, and then underneath that, or within that, I suppose, or housed in that, or integrated in that even, you have the pranamaya kosha, which is made of prana, which is your, your uh, life force or your energy. Um, and that prana moves through, there's like a, a network of channels in the body known as nadis, uh, which we find described even in the earliest Upanishads, the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. Then we have the Manomaya Kosha, which is related to Manas. If you watch the video on mind, then you know what that is. Man Manomaya Kosha is the mental or emotional body, which refers to the Manas, which is the processor of sensory input. Within that, we have the Vijnana Maya Kosha, which is the intellectual body. It's the Buddhi, which is the intellectual mind or the kind of discriminative cognitive mind. This is your, your wisdom, your intelligence, your understanding. And also within the Vijnana Maya Kosha is the Ahankara, which is the eye maker. For more on that, see the mind video again. And within that, at the very center of all of this, we have the Ananda Maya Kosha, which is the so-called bliss sheath or the center of you which is like the essence of uh, the universal consciousness um, the greater power the source of bliss um, and so these are understood to be the five layers of our being um, if you watch the mind video or if you know a little bit about kind of the understanding of mind you'll see that it's integrated into the body and that the body is part of the mind the uh, yoga tradition doesn't see mind as actually something separated from body. It sees that you have like your yourself and your like your your universal consciousness within you, and then you have the mind, which is like a functioning of your material nature. Mm -hmm. So um, that is a little. It shows you that the mind is something tangible that you can deal with. And it shows that the body is also something tangible that you can deal with. And this kosha system, it, uh, it appears in this Taittiriya Upanishad. And in say, inside that, it says that each kosha, the, each layer is filled with the other. And it's understood that they kind of self-integrate, they, they interrelate between each other. Which means that when you work with the body, it means that you can work with the mind and the cognitive mind and the spirit at the very center of it. Hmm. So I really like that because it means that you don't see yourself as something disparate, but you see yourself as this kind of like multi-layered, lovely. Sometimes people compare it to the uh, like onion skin. I like to think of it as the creamy, caramel, crunchy center within the delicious like chocolate bar that is you. <laughs> lovely. So let's move forward a little bit to the Bhagavad Gita, where we have the Bhagavad Gita, of course, takes all the Upanishadic wisdom and kind of gathers it together and makes it, um, really kind of explains it in, in practical, real life terms. And so, of course, they're going to talk about the body because it's all about how you deal with being in the world. And so in this text, Arjuna, the main character, is struggling with the notion of having to kill his own cousins and his loved ones. And so, um, Krishna starts by explaining to him that actually he wouldn't be really killing them because the real them is not their body. This is getting straight to the point. He says it like this, just as when a person casts off worn out clothing and puts on new clothing, the embodied one casts off worn out bodies and gets new ones. So this is part of this idea, of course, of reincarnation, of samsara, the cycle, the endless cycle of reincarnation, and also it's related to karma. And so it understands that you have an atman, you have a self, 
And then it's almost like your your body is your jacket that you put on and, and you get a new one. And so throughout the text, they talk a lot about the Atman and they talk about um, the relationship actually between that Atman and the body. And here's an example of that. Renouncing all actions with the mind. Quietly, he sits in full control, the embodied self within the city with nine gates. He neither acts nor causes to act. So the real you is like the king sitting in within your city with nine gates. So which are your gates? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then the genital organ and the anus. And obviously for women, there would be another one. I think I've also heard 11, where the crown of the head, the fontanelle, is included as one of the gates. These are the nine entrances where information enters the body via the senses and things exit the body. And so it's our interface with the outside world. But within that sits the Dehin, the embodied one, the Atman, the king. And it is the real you doesn't really do things. The real you doesn't do the actions and the and your your whole life. It's just your your body kind of doing things or your material nature doing things. Remember that the mind is included within that. But the true you is seated at the center of this, untouched by any of it. And it's or here you have the metaphor of a city. In the first quote from the Gita I mentioned, you had the metaphor of clothing. One more metaphor, and this one is my favorite, and I even use it in like my teaching bios, um, that they describe, so uh, the beautiful Lord said, Sri Bhagavan Uvacha, this body, O Kaunteya, son of Kunti, son of woman, O human, O mortal, this is said to be the field. That which knows it is declared by the wise to be the knower of the field. Know me, Krishna, as the knower of the field in all fields, O Parata. Knowledge of the field and the field knower, the uh, Kshetra Gnana, the, are considered by me to be the true knowledge. So I like to think of it as this, you know, the Bhagavad Gita is set on, set on Kurukshetra, the field of action. And that's the name of a place. But it means kuru is from the verbal root kur, and kshetra is a field. So it's the battlefield of action, of life. And where can you live if not in this body? Uh, there's a poem by Philip Larkin I really love where he says, where can we live but days? Where can we live but in this body? So your body is the field where your life grows. And the, the kshetra jnana, the knower of the field, is your awareness which is aware of you living in this field. So there's kind of this relationship, again, between... You can feel that you have some sort of knower. You have, this, you have the feeling of being aware of something. If you're watching this video or you're thinking a thought, that some, the, the light behind that is this knower of the field. But we can't do anything without an actual body. Um, we can't actually go about into the world without having a field in which to grow the flowers or the crops of our life's work. I really love that. I think it's very beautiful. Oh, and so uh, Krishna actually goes on to describe what this field is. The five elements, the Mahabhutas, the Ahankara, the eye maker, the Bhuti, the intelligence, you see echoes here, um, the unmanifest, which, you know, is the, the center, the, you know, the universal, the 10 senses, the mind, and the five objects of the senses. Also, desire, hatred, happiness, and distress, the whole organism, intelligence, and courage. This is the field with its capacity for change, briefly explained. Fantastic. Why am I bothered making this video? Because that's just, it's all there. Chapter 13 of the Bhagavad Gita. So this is great. So you could see that the, the tradition understands that um, the body is necessarily where we have to do our practice because we live in it. And in chapter six, also in the Gita, you know, there's direct explanations of like, sit, in, sit up tall and, you know, have your spine long and, you know, pull in your neck and have your neck long and no, 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 you know, sit on, it describes what kind of seat you should sit on, like you should have the kusha grass and you, have, you should have, you know, the deer skin. Um, the physical reality is not denied. And I really like that. 
um, because I'm all for realism. <laughs> so the thing is, though, at this time, yes, you're sitting, you're meditating, but that's that's it. You're sitting. You're not walking around doing, you know, Virabhadrasana too or whatever. Um, that hasn't come into the practice yet. The asana is. So you know this word asana, I'm sure, which is, you know, we call it now, we use asana to, to describe the physical stuff that we do with our body. But actually, um, in the Bhagavad Gita, for example, the asana is the stuff you sit on, the stuff you put your asana on. <laughs> um, and so uh, asana doesn't, like the asana practice, the postural practice doesn't come until much later after uh, the tantric movements and philosophies and hatha yoga, which is all about um, using the forces and energies of the body to achieve liberation. So necessarily the body is actually a tool. And you use in the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, they describe how you cleanse the body and make it strong and make it clear and clean in order that it can be a vehicle in which you can do your practice. There's one quote um, from the Timur Randiram, which is a 10th century text, which for me really well represents like the turning point between the attitudes in the body. And it goes like this, once I despise the body, but then I saw the divine within it and I realized the body is the Lord's temple. Thus, I began to preserve it with great care. So it's understood that the spirit is within the body. And so the more you take care of the body, the better, the more your spirit is going to be taken care of as well. Whereas in the ascetic tradition at the very beginning, especially if you have, you know, the tapas twins, the people who stood on one leg for 50 years, their idea was to kind of just like break the body down so that your spirit could vanquish it. Okay. And so also the body can be divine in and of itself. Um, I really like also in the, in like the, the tantric period, they like to think about the body as a microcosm of the macrocosm. So like the world is in the body. Um, and I really like this as, as a way kind of, you can understand the world via your body and you can understand the body by thinking of it in terms of the world. So I'll read here from the Amrita Siddhi, which is one of the first Hatha Yoga texts, and that's the 11th century. Uh, Mount Meru, so that's the, Mount Meru is the, a golden mountain at the center of the universe, and it's the axis of the world where the gods live. Mount Meru exists in the body, with seven islands, three worlds, and 14 levels. In it are oceans, rivers, regions, and guardians of the regions, gathering places, sacred sites, seats of deities, and the deities of the seats. Lunar mansions, all the planets, sages and holy men, the moon and sun, moving about, causing creation and destruction, all of this within your body. The sky, the wind and fire, water and earth, Vishnu divided and undivided, Shiva, the lord of beings, and Prajapati, which is one of the names of the sun. This may all seem a bit weird, but for certain, the people who composed this text were thinking of exact things within the body that they had experienced and that they were describing through the metaphor of a river or of uh, three worlds or the moon and the sun. You know, uh, whereas then they didn't, of course, have x-rays or other like medical or uh, scientific, you know, modern scientific approaches to look at the body. They did look at the body, absolutely, but they just used something else to see the inside of the body, which is their awareness. And this is the terms that they described it in. Using this understanding of the body, the Hatha yogis and the tantric yogis started to use the body as a tool, as a temple, as a vehicle within their practices. At this point, we already have asana happening and other practices which use the energies of the body, like more complex pranayamas, you know, breath exercises and visualizations, which we, where we place things within the body. Nyasa is called, how we get the word vinyasa. Um, and uh, so the body is a tool which they're using to achieve liberation. Now, the thing is that liberation is the goal at this point in time. And only when we get to like the 20th century is health actually something that people are trying to achieve. Within the 19th century, a lot in England and I guess in Europe as well, there was this notion of a healthy body and a healthy mind. And it was even associated with morality is that you had this, uh, I really like this concept of muscular Christianity that you, you know, this is why how the YMCA was born, that you, you know, you take care of your body and you're a good Christian. Um, and this definitely had an influence through like British influence in India on the yogis who were practicing and this resurgence of yoga as 
a practice that Indians were doing to, to be healthy um, and to be uh, respected in the society and also to prove to the British that they had their own form, their own way of taking care of themselves. In the uh, 1910s and 1920s, we start to see yoga institutes, so like scientific yoga study institutes being set up. The oldest one is the Yoga Institute, uh, which was set up in Mumbai in 1918 by Sri Yogendra. And I really like, um, there's this, a description of how physical posture and asana works um, in Yogendra's book, Yoga Asana Simplified. Neuromuscular education by the habitual exercise of effort come endurance can bring about a maximum of contractibility of the whole muscular system and in consequence raise the tone and enlarge the field of efficiency. When this simple truth is applied to the internal organs, as happens to be the case with yoga physical culture, it's no wonder that physical efficiency becomes multiplied and the height of biologic perfection is ultimately achieved. Biologic perfection. Also, note, yoga physical culture. This is where it's, it, we've come a long way from just sitting down and, and quieting the mind. It becomes something that you do with your body to improve the state of your body for the sake of the state of the body, you know, and it's not necessarily, there's no sort of soteriological goal, there's no aim of liberation, at least not described here. And so when we're looking at yoga as striving towards biologic perfection, and in particular biology, we start to look at the body from an anatomical perspective. And whereas before, we were using nadis, and chakras, and rivers, and, uh, and moon and sun to map the body, now it becomes bones and muscles and maybe the nervous system and maybe even the endocrine system. And that's how we tend to think about our body nowadays. I mean, if you look at um, pictures like this, this is how you tend to look at, think about the yoga body of muscles and a rib cage and nice physical shapes. Um, this is how we tend to visualize the body. And when I'm teaching, I definitely use a lot of metaphor, but most of the time what we tend to think of is, you know, think about the femur turning around in the acetabulum, you know, the hip socket. Um, this is how we think about the body. And in yoga teacher trainings, they're not telling you about how to think about the rivers of the body or, you know, Mount Meru. We're learning about, you know, um, uh, a biological anatomical approach to sustainable and strong and healthy movement. And that's, you know, the framework that is popular now. That's how we like to think about the, mod the body. I really like that Jim Mallinson in uh, The Roots of Yoga calls it medical realism. And that phrase just kind of highlights the fact that um, this is yet another approach, you know, but for me, I noticed that this approach, in the same way as the ones from the very beginning, allow you to kind of depersonalize the body. If you think about doctors, they don't, they're not squeamish, they know it's just a body. In the same way, long-time yoga practitioners, uh, the more they understand the body's functioning, the less attached they become to it. So what? We've, we've seen a really large range of viewpoints on the body over the centuries, from the, from seeing the body as something disgusting that we need to separate ourselves from, to the body being a divine vehicle using which we move around the world. We've seen some from the very beginning that the yoga tradition understands that this is our body and we're in it. And it has problems with it. It's sometimes unclean. It can be unpredictable. We need to do things to sometimes keep it in check. Like now we can do a yoga practice, like a physical yoga practice, or maybe some breath and stuff like that. Um, but also the fact that um, we can use it as a tool for liberation, necessarily, that you can bring the body into so much harmony that it allows you to see clearly, to see the world as it really is. Also, you can bring work with the body in order to see past the body, to see that there's something else perhaps inside, something internal, an Atman. This is our vehicle and our glorious home, but it's not us and not forever. It may be divine, but it's divinely temporary. And if there's something eternal, it must be more than this body. 
But the thing is, if you don't actually understand this body well, whichever map you use to look at it, you're never going to see it. So when you're working with your body, doing your yoga practice, notice your perspective on it. Maybe you can have a little bit more insight on how it feels for you to be in this body now. And if you are in this body, then who's you? And that's another question for another day. So we'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Om Shanti.